Salvador Dali, born May 11, 1904 in Figueres, a small town outside Barcelona, to a prosperous middle-class family. The family suffered greatly before the artist's birth, because their first son, also named Salvador, died shortly after his birth. The young artist was often told that he is the reincarnation of his dead brother. His larger-than-life persona blossomed early alongside his interest in art. He is claimed to have manifested random, hysterical, rage-filled outbursts toward his family and playmates. His lawyer father and his mother greatly nurtured his early interest in art. He had his first drawing lessons at age 10 and in his late teens was enrolled at the Madrid School of Fine Arts, where he experimented with impressionist and pointillist styles. At 16, Dolly lost his mother to breast cancer, which was according to him, the greatest blow I had experienced in my life. When he was 19, his father hosted a solo exhibition of the young artist's technically exquisite charcoal drawings in the family home. In 1922 Dali enrolled at the Special Painting, Sculpture and Engraving School of San Fernando in Madrid, where he lived at the Residencia de Estudiantes. He kept his hair long and dressed in the style of English esthetes from the 19th century, complete with knee-length bridges that earned him the title of a dandy. Artistically, he experimented with many different styles at the time, dabbling in whatever piqued his ravenous curiosity. He fell in with and became close to a group of leading artistic personalities that included filmmaker Luis Buñuel and poet Federico García Lorca. The residence itself was very progressive and exposed Dolly to the most important minds of the times such as Le Corbusier, Einstein, Calder and Stravinsky. Ultimately though, Dolly was expelled from the academy in 1926 for insulting one of his professors during his final examination before graduation. Following his dismissal from school, Dolly went idle for a number of months. He then took a life-changing trip to Paris. He visited Pablo Picasso in his studio and found inspiration in what the Cubists were doing. He became greatly interested in futurist attempts to recreate motion and show objects from simultaneous multiple angles. He began studying the psychoanalytic concepts of Freud as well as metaphysical painters like Giorgio de Chirico and surrealists like Joan Miro, and consequently began using psychoanalytic methods of mining the subconscious to generate imagery. Over the course of the next year, Dolly would explore these concepts while working to consider a means of dramatically reinterpreting reality and altering perception. In 1928, Dolly partnered with the filmmaker Luis Buñuel on Anchi and Andalou, an Andalusian dog, a filmic meditation on abject obsessions and irrational imagery. The film's subject matter was so sexually and politically shocking that Dolly became infamous causing quite a stir with the Parisian surrealists. This was the first time Dolly and Gallo would meet and shortly after the two began having an affair which eventually resulted in her divorce of Allured. Gallo, born in Russia as Elena Dmitrievna Diakona, became Dolly's lifelong, constant and most important muse, as well as being his future wife, his greatest passion, and his business manager. Soon after this original meeting, Dolly moved to Paris, and was invited by André Breton to join the Surrealists. Dolly ascribed to Breton's theory of automatism, in which an artist stifles conscious control over the creative process by allowing the unconscious mind and intuition to guide the work. Yet in the early 1930s, Dolly took this concept a step further by creating his own paranoic critical method, in which an artist could tap into their subconscious through systematic irrational thought in a self-induced paranoid state. After emerging from a paranoid state, Dolly would create hand-painted dream photographs from what he had witnessed. 
oftentimes culminating in works of vastly unrelated yet realistically painted objects which were sometimes intensified by techniques of optical illusion. He believed that viewers would find intuitive connection with his work because the subconscious language was universal, and that it speaks with a vocabulary of the great vital constants. Sexual instinct, feeling of death, physical notion of the enigma of space, these vital constants are universally echoed in every human. He would use this method his entire life. Most famously seen in paintings such as The Persistence of Memory, 1931, and Soft Construction with Boiled Beans, Premonition of Civil War, 1936. While his career was on the rise, Dolly's personal life was undergoing change. Although he was both inspired and besotted by Gala, his father was less than enthused at this relationship with a woman ten years his son's senior. His early encouragement for his son's artistic development the final straw came when Dolly was quoted by a Barcelona newspaper as saying, Sometimes, I spit for fun on my mother's portrait. The elder Dolly expelled his son from the family home at the end of 1929. In the following years Dolly traveled widely and practiced more traditional painting styles that drew on his love of canonized painters like Gustav Corbett and Jan Vermeer. Though his emotionally charged themes and subject matter remained as strange as ever, his fame had grown so widely that he was in demand by the rich, well-known and fashionable. In 1938, Coco Chanel invited Dolly to her home, La Paza, on the French Riviera where he painted extensively, creating work later exhibited at the Julian Levy Gallery in New York. But undoubtedly, Dolly's true magic moment came that year when he met his hero, Sigmund Freud. After painting his portrait, Dolly was thrilled to learn that Freud had said, so far, I was led to consider completely insane the surrealist who I think I had been adopted as the patron saint. This young Spaniard with his candid, fanatical eyes and his undeniable technical mastery has made me change my mind. Around this time Dolly also met a major patron, the wealthy British poet Sir Edward James. James not only purchased Dolly's work, but also supported him financially for two years and collaborated on some of Dolly's most famous pieces including The Lobster Phone, 1936, and Mae West Lips Sofa, 1937, both of which decorated James's house in Sussex, England. Dolly had a presence in the United States even before his first visit to the country. The art dealer Julian Levy organized an exhibition of Dolly's work in New York in 1934. Including the persistence of memory, the exhibition was incredibly well received turning Dolly into a sensation. He first visited the U.S. in the mid-1930s. Dolly continued to ruffle the waters wherever he went, oftentimes staging deliberate public appearances and interactions which were in essence early examples of his love for performance. Dolly also participated in other surrealist events while in New York. He was featured in the first exhibition on fantastic art, Dada Surrealism at the Museum of Modern Art. He also made quite the scene at a showing of Joseph Cornell's surrealist films when he knocked over the projector, famously fuming, My idea for a film is exactly that, and I was going to propose it to someone who would pay to have it made. I never wrote it down or told anyone, but it is as if he had stolen it. After the devastation of the Second World War in Europe, Dolly and Gala returned to the United States in 1940. They would remain for eight years. Splitting time between New York and California. During this period, Dolly became highly productive, expanding his practice beyond the visual arts into a wide array of other creative interests. After being ousted from the family home in 1929, Dolly purchased a small seaside house in the nearby fisherman village of Port Legot. Eventually he bought up all of the houses around it, 
transforming his property into a grand villa. Gala and Dolly moved back to Port Legat in 1948, making it their home base for the next three decades. Dolly's art continued to evolve. Besides exploring different artistic mediums, Dolly also started using optical illusions, negative space, visual puns, and trompe in his work. Starting in 1948, he would make approximately one monumental painting per year, his Dolly Masterworks, that were at least five feet long in one or both directions and creatively occupied Dolly for at least a year. His studio had a special slot built into the floor that would allow the huge canvases to be raised and lowered as he worked on them. He painted at least 18 such works between 1948 and 1970. In the 1940s and 1950s, Dolly's paintings focused primarily on religious themes reflecting his abiding interest in the supernatural. He famously claimed, I am a carnivorous fish swimming in two waters, the cold water of art and the hot water of science. He aimed to portray space as a subjective reality, which may be why many of his paintings from this period show objects and figures at extremely foreshortened angles. He continued employing his paranoia critical method, which entailed working long, arduous hours in the studio and expressing his dreams directly on canvas in manic bouts of energy. When his book The World of Salvador Dali was published in 1962, he signed autographed copies at a bookstore in Manhattan while hooked up to a monitor recording his blood pressure and brain waves. Customers left with a signed copy and a printout of Dali's vitals. He also made a number of commercials for televisions and other media for companies such as Landvin Chocolates, Alka Seltzer, and Braniff Airlines. In the 1960s when Dolly came to New York City, he always stayed at the St. Regis Hotel on Fifth Avenue. He made the hotel bar practically his living room, where parties raged throughout his stay. At the time, Dolly had an entourage of strange and charismatic characters that he spent his time with. Andy Warhol, another eccentric collector of outrageously wacky humans, also spent time with Dolly at the St. Regis. In one legendary story, Warhol brought a silk screen painting as a gift to Dolly. But the older artist threw it on the ground at the hotel and proceeded to pee on it. Rather than get offended, Warhol supposedly loved the whole episode. The last two decades of Dolly's life would be the most difficult. In 1968, he bought a castle in Pubble for Gala and in 1971 she began staying there for weeks at a time on her own. Forbidding Dolly from visiting without her permission, her retreats gave Dolly a fear of abandonment and caused him to spiral into depression. Gala inflicted permanent damage on Dolly after it came to light that, in her senility, she had marred his health by dosing him with non-prescribed medication. The physical damage that Gala wrought on Dolly hindered his art-making capacity until his death. After her death in 1982, Dolly experienced a further bout of depression and is believed to have attempted suicide. He also moved into the castle in Pubble, the site of her death. One of Dolly's most important achievements during this rough time was the creation of the Dolly Theatre Museum in Figueres. Rather than donating a single work to the city, Dolly said, Where? If not in my own town, should the most extravagant and solid of my work endure, where if not here? The municipal theatre, or what remained of it, struck me as very appropriate. In preparation for the museum's opening in 1974, Dolly worked tirelessly to design the building and put together the permanent collection that would serve as his legacy. On January 23, 1989, Dolly died of heart failure while listening to his favorite record, Tristan and Isolde. He is buried beneath the museum that he built in Figueres.